Hello and welcome. My name is Danielle. I'll be your host today as we discuss Awakening Starseeds, Volume 1 and 2. Today we have a very special guest with us, Byron Bradley Carrier. <laughs> he is a co-author in Awakening Starseeds of Volume 1 and 2. Welcome, Brian. How are you? I'm fine. How are you, Danielle? I'm doing well. And it's Byron. I apologize. I keep saying that's all right. It happens a lot. <laughs> Well, I appreciate your time today and being here with us. Uh, before we dive into your chapter, would you share with us a little bit about your background and what it is that brought you to this point? Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, I guess I'm on the on the front edge of the baby boom. Uh, I was born in 1945. <clears throat> it's in the stories. I, I was born on the same day they bombed Hiroshima. And uh, so it's been kind of a background theme in my life a little bit. Uh, just knowing that fact and uh, grew up mostly in Michigan and uh, stumbled around in high school and ended up getting a job at a funeral home, uh, helping them over and then learning that business and then going to college in order to be a funeral director. And uh, that got me to college and the funeral work. Plus we ran ambulance for the area too, uh, was interesting and uh, very real. Uh, but I didn't want to spend all my time just doing that. And so I ended up going on in school, which I liked. I liked college and getting a bachelor's degree in psychology and philosophy. And by that time, I had been going to a Unitarian Universalist church. I hadn't gone to any church since I left the Catholic church when I was 14. Um, and I liked that they were more open minded and, and inclusive of different points of view. So I ended up going to a seminary uh, in, at the University of Chicago, uh, eventually got a master's degree there in order to do a ministry for the Unitarian Universalist. And I did. I've done that for 50 years, kind of on and off, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit in Illinois, in Urbana, Illinois, a little bit in eastern North Carolina, out in the country for a Universalist church. And then finally here in Ashland, Oregon, which is the southernmost town in Oregon, uh, just above California on the, on the freeway. And um, uh, it's had an eight year ministry here in this town. But, and while I was here, I got another group started in Grants Pass, which is a couple towns over. And uh, that group ended up taking off too, as well as the Ashland group. So uh, I'm now retired and uh, considered what they call emeritus at the, at the Grants Pass fellowship. So I've had that sort of a kind of um, academic, professional, uh, interpersonal kind of background through the ministry it gets pretty intense sometimes. And I just also needed to, to work other than ministry, because I didn't ever never made much money at this. And I made a little bit more money doing rock walls, I, I stack up uh, boulders and, and rocks in a way to hold the dirt up so that, you know, because everything is steep here. So you create a rock wall and holds the dirt up and the, and the patio is flat and the face of the wall is pretty. So I did that for 20 years and uh, very different than the academic route. And now I'm retired and I don't do the rock walls except for the fun of it now. And uh, am uh, attempting to do some writing of my own and happen to know uh, Radha and uh, Maya who are putting the uh, Awakening Starseeds books together and uh, was invited to write something. So I, I did for the first one, people seemed to like it. So I wrote another one for the second edition, another uh, point of view or something, something along that line. I'm a little bit different than uh, uh, some of the other entries in the book. Uh, I have, I don't, uh, I, I tend to not claim experience beyond what I really, really had and uh, not just copy what other people say about things. So that was that was my approach was to value our physical bodies and by extension, our ecosystem as the primary place where we should be concerned, religiously concerned um, that um, speculations about afterlife or God or the nature of God and all these things are always interesting to humans, but to me, it's more important to radically affirm, especially in our uh, somewhat disconnected Puritan society, radically affirm 
our incarnation. You know, we have a body for at least this one lifetime, and that's a, a magnificent opportunity. So that's kind of the gist of what I ended up writing about. I love that. Now, what does the word star seed mean to you personally? Pardon? Oh, the, what does the uh, word star seed mean to you? Well, yeah, if if, um, if, uh, if you read the, what I wrote, you'll see that uh, I'm, I take it literally. I, I, I believe that we are made of matter and energy and that uh, to consider a, you know, the body as though it's unimportant is not, a, is not wise. Uh, I think uh, the, the picture of reality that, uh, that science has put together is far more interesting and uh, uh, full of p potential and possibility than the old stories that we heard about through various religious traditions and scriptures and whatnot. So the star seed, uh, I, I guess I'm, I'd be, uh, I think I even mentioned uh, Carl Sagan. Uh, I don't know if you know that name. He's a, a, a physicist, a scientist who made science popular back uh, two or three decades ago. And he, he reminds us that everything that, that we use on the earth and including our bodies is made of, of stuff that came out of an earlier star that exploded. Uh, so we are reincarnated stuff from uh, the star that, uh, that blew up, went supernova 14 billion years ago. Or no, 14 billion was the start of everything. And then there was a, a proto star that that went uh, super that blew up and created the larger molecules that that we need to have life and uh, so i affirm that i, I and i uh, i find it very inspiring to think of the actuality of physics and chemistry and biology coming together to create these uh, thriving organisms us and the rest of the animals and um and then i'm interested in how culture uh, teaches about that and either either helps us align with it and make it good or uh, too much I think in religious traditions they kind of ignore it or take it for granted or even denigrate it mm. and uh, I'm again <laughs> I'm again that approach uh, I think we should uh, affirm our bodies and our ecosystem and treat both with a, a lot of love and ingenuity and then things will get better again right now the world climate the COVID, all these things, all these challenges are, um, are because we're not taking it heartfully and thoughtfully enough. So I, I believe in the concept of Eden, as it were, not a specific space, place, but a planet that allows life. And we can, you know, help that along or we can ruin it. And in some ways, many things are being ruined right now. Species going instinct, the we're oceans heating up too much, getting acid. All these things are concerning to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I like that perspective too, because it's a little uh, different than some of the others I've heard. And for, it'll speak to the individuals that, you know, sure. in that, in that way. Different. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. How did you personally wake up to your starseed journey um, on a personal level? Well, it helped to be an embalmer and, and to tend an ambulance where I both was with people as they died or I caught uh, one or two people got, got them going again. Mm. And I also caught a baby. I, I don't say I delivered the baby. I caught the baby because <laughs> they come up pretty slippery when I was 18 <laughs> years old. So uh, in the back of an ambulance. So all this stuff to me is, uh, is very important. We, we have actual birth. We have actual death and uh, actual bodies uh, in the meantime. And uh, I think that helped awaken me, but also my dad, who was not particularly religious, um, my mom was Catholic and she had us raised Catholic. My dad wasn't, he would sit out in the parking lot during mass, but he had read a book by uh, Buck, B-U-C-K-E, um, uh, Cosmic Consciousness, which is kind of like a, a previous generation's version of what Rod is doing with Awakening Star Seeds. Various reports from people who have uh, spiritual awakening experiences 
uh, usually very dramatic and uh, life changing. Right. And so that's kind of what's uh, in the rest of the Star Seeds book. Mine is more, uh, I guess, rational to to uh, in terms of the philosophy of it. Even though um, in my body, I want to I want to experience joy and health, and I want to help other people find that too. That's beautiful. Could you share with us a little bit about your upcoming chapter in Awakening Star Seeds Volume Two? Uh, yeah, uh, I'd have to remember it. I haven't <laughs> read it for a while. I, I think I basically did what I just told you that I that I okay. was born on the Hiroshima day. I, mm -hmm. I had the funeral home ambulance experience. Uh, saw some gritty stuff there. And got to see how we're really constructed inside our bodies, just like they show you in the anatomy books. And, you know, it all works on our behalf automatically. We don't have to direct it. So to me, I'm very grateful for that process. And um, then because I was a uh, Unitarian minister, they're very open to different ideas, including atheists and humanists, as well as mystics and whatnot. So I'm used to being around people of differing beliefs. And um, uh, I like that. I like there's, that there's diversity going on. Uh, but as a minister, I also ended up being involved in many death situations mm. and birth situations and weddings and all that stuff. So it's a nice rounded uh, approach to life. But the death situations, um, yeah, they can be very uh, a very sacred occasion. Uh, it can also be very anguished and full of pain and fear. Uh, but uh, often people, they kind of I accept it and they, they, they go through the transition, whatever that transition is, uh, at least peacefully as they enter it. I don't claim to know what happens after death. And as a minister, that really disappoints a lot of people uh, that, who expect me to assure them that I know what's going to happen and just like they think it's going to be. And I, I can't, I can't do that. I can do it, you know, if it's, solace if they really believe that they're going to see their dearly departed spouse you know i'm not going to say no you're not you know <laughs> i'm going to say yeah i hope that happens something like that um yeah that's that's it <laughs> wow that's such a um unique experience that not a lot of people have an opportunity to have as far as the um because the birthing process is a time of celebration and you know you get welcomed but then when we pass, sometimes people don't realize the importance of someone being there with you and celebrating that transition because this is a part of the evolution and that is something we all experience at one point in our life. And to be alone, I feel like is, is unfortunate, but it's all at the same time, like if that's what, you know, they're going to experience, then that that is the situation and you'll never be alone because you're always with source. However, it is, um, like you said, sacred to have that experience. So that's a very unique perspective. Not a lot of people have an opportunity to experience. Did you have any kind of um, what you would call mystical experiences during some of those? Well, yeah, because I'm interested in this stuff, you know, kind of philosophically. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I have a, another sidetrack. I, I met a man from India uh, when I was at the University of Chicago named Dr. Vasavada, and he was an older man that had just come to the States uh, after having trained with Carl Jung, a, a psychologist, okay. the Jungian yeah. psychology. So he was an analyst, mm -hmm. and he came uh, to be a teaching analyst in the Chicago area, but he didn't drive. And so I would drive him around, we'd go shopping and he had meditation groups and I would sit with the meditation group and uh, we became friends over the years. And I went to India once with him. And so I had, I, I, I have sought out those who say or claim some sort of claim as to, you know, spiritual person of some sort. I like to get in their presence and see what the vibe is. And so I've, there's a bunch of them that I've been around. Wow. Um, and the, the blind saint was the main thing I went and saw in India. Although while I was in India, uh, I ran into a man that was at that time just getting known and a bit notorious in India named Rajneesh. Uh, and he had a, a darshan 
just a, in a nearby hotel to where I was recuperating because I had been, I gotten very sick. And uh, so I went and, and saw him in person once. And then years later, I, I hear about him here in Oregon. And then I saw this marvelous documentary that Netflix has put together called Wild Wild Country. It tells the story of Rajneesh here in, in the, well, in India, but also mostly here in the United States. And he's quite a character. And I, even though I had a, a reaction to him when I saw him in person and, and, and uh, got a little bit mad about what he was saying, um, I, uh, I didn't punch him. <laughs> I, I was going to, he was going on about how we are not the body and it's all Maya and the world is not real. But he had a big, you know, diamond watch on. He had all these adoring women coming around him. And um, he was a beautiful man, he had beautiful eyes, wonderful. But I said, and my thing was, I wanted to punch him. And that in order to ask him a question, I says, if you are not your body, Rajneesh, do you mind if I punch you again? <laughs> <laughs> But I wow. didn't really want to hurt Rajneesh, and I never did that. But here's here's one of the you after little experiences. One of the little tricks that happened was that as a meeting was breaking up, they came up and said, who are you? What are you? You know, because there was just a few Westerners coming around at that time. Please come and join us for our morning meditation down on the beach. And I was really sick. And, and I went back to my room and I thought, I'm not going to get out of my bed and go to a morning meditation on a beach. It's very uncomfortable. Da, da, da. But before I woke up, I had a dream where there was a meditation on the beach and there was a huge fire and everybody was dancing ecstatically around the fire. Well, maybe decades later, I find out that was their meditation. Oh. <laughs> so maybe I did get to go to the, the Rajneesh meditation. Yeah, and you I were did. there. <laughs> I've been interested in little uh, events like that that really happen that seem to carry a uh, meaning like mm -hmm. synchronicities, I yes. call them. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I also had a, a foot in the whole counterculture all this time. And the counterculture has uh, various what we call entheogens. The word means entheogen, in God generate. And basically sacramental substances that give you vision. Mm -hmm. So uh, beyond pot, which is uh, pleasant and, and helpful in many ways. Uh, LSD, uh, mescaline, uh, peyote, uh, the things that are like um, psychoactives, I've, I've been interested in and messed around with a bit. And then a few years ago, I, I uh, happened to take what is currently being used in ayahuasca. A lot of people are doing ayahuasca. Mm. And the main ingredient is DMT, 5-MeO-DMT. And so I had two different experiences a couple of years apart uh, with that. And it was so powerful and beautiful and overwhelming. I don't crave it anymore. Uh, it was just reassuring. So those experiences, when you really wake into all kinds of other levels and thoughts than you typically can think or tend to think anyway, is intriguing to me as to what is the ultimate nature of reality. You know, uh, I, I try to just talk about the parts I think I know about, but I don't want to just say what I think people want to hear about the ultimate nature of reality. You know, that we are God and we're an expression of that. And we'll, we'll realize that one way or the other, either in this life or over the many lifetimes, if, if that happens. But I don't know that it happens. I did ask various people during my lifetime to contact me because I knew they were dying, including my dad. Oh, wow. And if they could, and nothing's ever happened, but that might be because I'm too gross to, uh, to hear it. I don't know. So, and when you actually found out about Awakening Star Seeds, um, what inspired you to write and be a co-author in Awakening Star Seeds? I was helped along by Maya. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Maya is uh, Radha's mother and uh, she, she's a, a very sweet and wise person. Uh, and she encouraged me and she knew I did a little bit of writing. I have a web page where I put stuff where I've given talks or written editorials or stories and things like that. So she knew I, I liked to write and she asked me to write something. And so I whipped up the first one. People seemed to like it. And so I whipped up another one and <laughs> you can read about it in the book. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And the, this second one just came out on July 4th and today's July 5th. So there is a uh, pre-launch going on right now until the 17th. Yeah, it's right yeah. now people can get it for 99 cents. It's a pretty good deal. Oh yeah. 
I'm excited yeah. for them to read your second chapter. I mean, if they love the first one, they're going to love the second one. I know it for a fact. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> How supported did you feel during the process uh, while working with Rada Publications? Oh, I was, uh, I'm, I'm glad that they're doing that. They're, they're being entrepreneurial. You know, they're, they're venturing out to gather these uh, fantastic stories. And um, then I know they, they provide a lot of help to the, to the people, a lot. Not everybody's used to writing. I, I've kind of come out of an academic background where I've read a lot and then written a lot. And so I'm kind of used to writing. It's easy for me in many ways. And I know some of the rules, which helps keep it, uh, uh, makes it work better. Um, but a lot of people don't necessarily have those skills and they, they spend a fair amount of time helping them. And even in mine, there were suggestions that were made and, and corrections and improvements that, that, uh, brought it around and i was pleased that they went ahead and used my thing because in some ways it's different than the other entries to in, in the book mm. i'm not recounting some uh, fantastic experience that that put me over the edge or into the new realm like that blake painting where he's he's uh crawling out of one fantastic realm through the veil into an even more fantastic one <laughs> <laughs> so and I, I, I'm not saying these things don't happen, but I don't want to exaggerate my experiences in that realm. Um, I do affirm very, very deeply the one thing I found that has, has no downside, no drawback, and that's meditation itself. Mm -hmm. And so I've been a meditator for 50 years. And uh, I, 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 I like to think about the physiology of it, you know, what's, what's going on in terms of our brain state and our metabolism and uh, breath and the connection between breath and mind, all those things. But deeper than that, there's a, there's a calmness and, a, and a, a way of having the more important issues come up when you're close to the silence mm -hmm. in meditation. And, uh, you know, you think of somebody that you hadn't thought of, but you should have, you know, and or uh, an idea maybe. So I, I like the, the, the meditation. And like I said, I was interested in, in the psychedelics, the entheogens uh, from the counterculture. And then philosophically, you know, my whole career has been around people who dispute and talk back and forth about various ideas and what religion should be. And, uh, I have, I have my own niche, which I think is unusual enough that a lot of people don't get it. But nonetheless, I, I persevere with what I think I know. I'm open to new stuff. I'm open to finding out I'm, I don't know. I love that. You don't know what you don't know. And you're open yeah, to right. learning. That's like Donald Rumsfeld is one of the <laughs> <laughs> He's actually right. <laughs> <laughs> I think your perspective too is very much um, embraced by those who might be more left brain too. Um, in some cases, be more what? Uh, like left brain, you know, like your left, left brain, right. yeah. Because yeah. yeah. it gives them a, a, a different perspective, you know, or it, it kind of speaks to them probably a little bit more so if you were speaking in a way that was less. Maybe, maybe yeah, so. Possibly, yeah. yeah. Um, but with the, you know, full. Uh, being philosophical in general, I mean, it, I really think anyone who's philosophical has the ability to um, use both your hemispheres a little bit more balanced than, oh, yeah. you know, that's well, the reason some, why I bring that up, but yeah. There's some interesting things um, <clears throat> overlapping between meditation and altered uh, chemical states. Uh, I, I know a man who's very experienced in these realms, and he puts on psychedelic conferences and whatnot. And he put on a mind map uh, hat, you know, where it has all the sensors built into the hat, and they can read different parts of the brain, what's going on where and everything. And uh, took the 5-MeO-DMT. And um, what they call the default mode network, which is a combination of parts in the back and in the front that are typically active all the time. And that's the thing we ruminate, we're, we're thinking of stories, we, you know, we got dramas, da, da, da. I wanna do this, I wanna do that. That's the default mode network that we might just call ego. Mm. But when he took the, uh, the special stuff, that whole part just dropped away. It wasn't even there. The rest of his yeah. brain was still going. He's having this powerful spiritual experience. So it makes me, it gives some credence to the notion of, you know, you're caught by your ego and you got to let your God self shine through. Um, 
that makes some sense to me that that might be the case. And in meditation, you kind of learn to not take the default mode network and all the little interesting stories that it presents you that seriously <laughs> and try to get some detachment from it so that you're not overwhelmed by compulsive thoughts or worry or emotional uh, traumas, mm -hmm. all these things, pain, all these things can be somewhat, uh, you can be detached from somewhat so they're not ruining and, and running your life. And so I'm, I'm very um, appreciative that I've picked up that skill uh, meditation with Dr. Vasavita and others over my lifetime. And I'm interested in that uh, possibility that our consciousness can uh, leap into other realms of reality that are uh, super fantastic. Uh, one man I read a lot of uh, back in the 70s was a, a guy named Meher Baba. Uh, Meher Baba uh, got enlightened when he was 18. So, somebody hit him in the head with a stone, I think. And uh, he went home and uh, stopped eating and it, it wouldn't, for days and days, his mother was very concerned. He ended up a few years later uh, giving up talking and um, uh, didn't talk the rest of his life. And he also at one point gave up writing. He was writing a journal and that got lost. Uh, Gandhi uh, saw it, Mohandas Gandhi saw it and said, this man is who he says he is. It was Gandhi's mm -hmm. comment. But Mira Baba says, he says, I am, I am the avatar. I'm you know, beyond the savior here. I've come here to awaken you. And there are five or seven uh, levels of spiritual advancement beyond the first waking up. Well, for a while, I was thinking, maybe I'm just in the fifth level, but I'm not waking up in this lifetime, that kind of thought. <laughs> but later on, I decided maybe I'm just on the gross, gross level. <laughs> I'm not even on step one. <laughs> but in any case, there very well might be these fantastic abilities flying around, visiting other parts of the universe and all these things uh, that I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. But some people say they do. I get attracted to those that claim to know that kind of stuff, but I'm not necessarily a believer um, uh, a, a guru who impresses me since i've learned about him is a non uh, he's the head of the non demarga uh, uh, worldwide uh, work that they do and he's very traditional shiva a guru type person um, and has all kinds of claims that i don't know how to evaluate at all but he also was a very practical, intelligent man, and he wrote these marvelous uh, treatises on how to have a society that is uh, locally generated and regenerative and, and uh, how the economics would work, how the ecology would work. And his Ananda Marga uh, community tries to do that around the world. So I'm impressed with that kind of thing. I feel like we need rational, practical, uh, intelligent um, creative adaptations to our position as humanity right now, where everything's changing so rapidly and we're affecting the world so drastically, so suddenly, mm -hmm. you know, just in a matter of decades and whatnot, just an enormous impact. And, but to realize that, well, it doesn't have to be just for the bad, you know, we, we could, we could get this, uh, our rivers with, with more salmon in them like they used to have <laughs> and soil that keeps growing instead of getting washed away and blown away and stuff. So I'm interested in, in that side of things more than in the spiritual stuff where I feel like I'm communicating with other beings or any of the things that many people claim to do. Well, I think that's beautiful. And I wondered, so it sounds like you have a lot of experience, obviously, in meditation too. Um, and, you know, what are, some, can you give us a few of your um, examples of life lessons that you learned throughout the journey that you've been on uh, through your spiritual awakening and what do you mean by some experience? Uh, um, like, it's, could you give us a few of your life lessons that you've learned along the way? of growing through meditation but um awakening to your you know um spiritual awakening well um it's pretty much like i've said so far you know being around the the bodies at the funeral home and mm -hmm. delivering babies i caught two of my own uh, sons um home births and so um 
um, the uh, the psychedelics, which I I do not eschew. Uh, some spiritual people say you know you don't you don't need that, and maybe maybe you don't need it, but I think they help entheogens, those things, and then just you know I'm kind of politically uh, aware, and um, it overlaps to technology a lot, uh, where I I feel like we really can create a society that's not so um, angry and mean all the time. Mm. And based on, on these huge discrepancies between people who live in lives of squalor and those who live in lives of so much affluence, they can't possibly enjoy it. They can't be happy with that much affluence, yeah. you know? So this is the economically, I think things could be better. And in terms of, you know, having time off for, for your own life, for your own family, coming out of COVID, I think people are realizing, hey, mm -hmm. why am I driving to work all day long, sitting in that posture at that chair, doing this thing over and over again? Is that the best thing we could be doing for humanity? You know, right. so we, I wouldn't mind staying home more, being around the kids, you know, or going for a walk, take a nap, you know, it's mm -hmm. not so bad. I mean, the stars are still going to spin just like they do, whether we do it one way or the other, but how we live here on earth is going to matter according to what we do or don't do mm -hmm. so i'm interested in, in that that's where the technology comes in in my mind as a as an ethical concern as well as a, a practical or one around efficiencies and comfort and all that we have we have an ethics to live up to with our technologies and with our politics and um, the way we treat each other in society what whether we're joining into the the mad fray of everybody getting you and getting you back and and snarky emails and all this meanness that's prevailed for a couple of decades now yeah you know, we, don't, we don't have to do that I've, i come from the hippies you know it's, hey brother hey, <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's no reason to be so tense I, yeah there's a lot of pressure that has you know that's been building for sure yeah. um what would you tell someone that may be listening that may be interested in working with Wada Publishing, uh, Publishing House? What would you tell them as far as um, what you got out of this experience and why they ought to step forward and partake in the upcoming series? Uh, I, I would encourage people to try to be authentic with what, whatever happened. It could be a little thing that happened. It doesn't have to be a huge dramatic thing. It might be some little realization mm -hmm. or some thing you want to say that you hadn't said so far. Or, um, maybe it was a realization that you haven't shared or something, but go ahead and write it. Go ahead and write it down. Don't worry about how to write it. Um, good writing starts by just letting it flow, you know, mm -hmm. write a lot, you know, and <laughs> then you got to be willing to cut a lot. <laughs> that's the hard part <laughs> you get attached to the words but that makes it, sense. <laughs> yeah and it, and it helps to have people either friends or, or a, a mentor of some sort to 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 uh, keep the, the language crisp and clear so that um like i i read books about writing and, and you know it says good writing is concise you know you get to the point you make it point bang it's there like a hemingway sentence you know it's just like mm -hmm. works because it's short and to the point and uh, I, when I deal with other writers who are writing various sorts of things, I really appreciate it when they just go ahead and write it kind of brief, get it done, get it said, and then you can go back and touch it and make it more uh, suitable for people that aren't using your own, your own thoughts. You know, other people have their own thoughts and they're trying to read your thing through their thoughts. So then how do you convey that to them? Well, you got to have clear sentences, coherent paragraphs you know, some sort of a flow, some sort of a coming to the point, the climax of it and all that. And maybe I'm saying too much here. I, I think more important, just uh, people do have stories and, and humans love to hear each other's stories and it's good for us to do that. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage people to go ahead and, and uh, make an association with uh, Radha and Maya and, and, um, and do some writing and see where it goes. Right. You might end up writing something that everybody's, you know, excited about and it opens up a uh, writing yeah. itself, you know, What's or it, it might help people just to read something that you've, you, that you've right. learned. Your, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what's uh, next for you as far as in the works, do you have um, a next, a new project that's coming up or 
Yeah, actually, uh, Maya knows. She's heard me complain that um, I'm trying to write a book that I have envisioned for over 50 years um, that, that uses a, a scripture passage, the first page of the Bible, uh, to set up a philosophical position. The first page of the Bible is the Genesis 1 story, the God is Elohim, which is a vague name for God, singular and plural, masculine and feminine. And Elohim creates the, the world in six days. People love to ridicule it because that's silly. Who can create something in six days? But I think of it more as six epochs of time. And they tend, in the story that got written down by somebody back when, they tend to follow what science is now telling us, that there was a big bang, there was light, there was water, there was land. Finally, there were plants, and then there were fishes and animals, and then there were humans. And the important part about that one page story is that each of those stages is called good by God. Then there's another creation story right after it. And there's no transition. It's just in the numbers, suddenly you're in a different thing. And it's the Garden of Eden story. There's a different God. It's Yahweh's singular and masculine, just descended from a war God uh, kind of lineage, as it were. But in any case, it's a very artificial story where God takes mud and breathes life and takes the rib out and it becomes the woman. And then they're not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they, they do. And you know the story. They get kicked out. And a lot of um, Christendom and perhaps also, um, I don't know for sure, like in Jewish and Islamic religions, because they all use the same foundation for their scriptures. What, what Christians call the Old Testament is pretty much the same set of books that all three major theistic religions use. And so the, the first story, the Genesis 1, and then the Garden of Eden story are kind of core. But how they're understood is important, because they say that they have a rationale for what Adam and Eve did and whether we have original sin and what you got to do to fix that. You got to believe in order to be redeemed. You won't go to hell. All this stuff is a bunch of hooey. Um, I think it, the story is clear. What was good was declared in the first story. Then you get a judgment of what's good and evil. We're going to know better what is good and evil. And we don't necessarily and what it ends up doing is, is creating shame and blame and pain. Uh, you know, Adam blames Eve, you know, <laughs> they get, they have to hide their genitals, you know, so they, they, they were naked before and there was no shame involved, you know. And I've been around situations where that is the case with hippies or nudist colonies and things like that. There's no need for shame for our bodies. You know, this is ridiculous. It's insulting to God to have shame. But um the uh, they get kicked out now they have to toil and there's pain in childbirth and da 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 it goes on and on and i think the whole story got messed up right there and so i try to rewrite that and say well what if we really understood that what is good is those six goods that came out in the first story and work with it then the, i have a, the book has been in process for years and years um um what would western history you know there's like these trails of thought where into some people's mind to think for yourself is a disobedient thing to god you should be obeying and believing instead and i think that is a bunch of hooey i think we're born with big brains because we're supposed to use them and not uh, you know abuse them and and ignore them and shame them and all that so um i think we should think we should be for ourselves there's one word in that Genesis uh, one's part that uh, gets seized upon, you know, you should have dominion, you know, dominion over the plants and animals and all that. Well, yeah, we do. We largely do. I mean, we, we can go under the water, we can go through the soil, go through the space, all that. But it, dominion doesn't necessarily have mean you, you're like a mean king who takes all the goodies for himself. I think dominion is sovereignty that we have our freeborn earthling abilities and when we stand up in them when we use our own brain when we're authentic when we are uh, sensitive to our own empathy and compassion uh, that these are the goods that we will build up and the goods in nature will be built up again they won't be endlessly exhausted extracted from ruined 
ridden with plastic and and toxic chemicals this this is crazy time we're living in in terms of all that stuff and we can fix it you know they'll come out with packaging that you can compost in the yard uh, you, you know our cars our electric cars are like you know three times uh, cleaner to use uh, if we're going to use cars at all than the gasoline powered ones or the diesels so stuff like that comes to me out of these two stories the genesis one and the genesis two three i've been trying to write the book for decades and it's intermittent because i get distracted in other life uh, things and then I try to get back into it. And then I'm trying to remember quotes and books I read back in seminary, you know, 40 years ago. Um, and so I have to restart it uh, a few times. And if anybody's going to read a book that's that long and involved, it's got to be interesting writing. And, and um, it's a challenge to me to, to keep it uh, going and to come out with something that hopefully really does help um, persons in themselves, persons with each other, the connections between us, persons in our society, how, how we, our attitudes, the memes that we generate and, and go by in society, persons in our, in our uh, democracy, in our various governments. And um, so I, I, I have a vision of, of us coming to peace with the fact that we are freeborn earthlings and that everybody is in the ought to be, mm. you know, so yeah. I have a symbol wow. for that. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your time, Byron. I mean, you have a brilliant mind and I'm really thrilled for people to read uh, your chapter and the upcoming book that you'll be working on. Well, have been working on. <laughs> yeah, I have been. <laughs> yeah, for I quite a while. Right here. I got books all over the floor. <laughs> <laughs> the true philosopher. <laughs> I love it. Well, the, I, the, I feel like books you, and the guitar too. <laughs> I'll have to have you on uh, another time so we can hear a little bit further more because it sounds like you have a lot of really great things to share with the world. Um, and again, like I said, I look forward to everyone hearing, you know, through your perspective, your chapter in Awakening Star Seeds Volume 2 that just came out. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll link below your information. If you have a website, we'll provide that for people to get a hold of you. Sure. Yeah, they and, can go to my website and read stuff and see, see stuff. I put stuff there okay. every month. Excellent. Uh, at the last yeah. minute, usually. By the way, thank you for mm -hmm. this nice interview, uh, Danielle. And I, I wish you uh, success and, and interesting ventures because of your new, uh, you're posting a new, um, like a podcast site or something. Is that oh, what you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll have a YouTube channel up and I'm going to add a it YouTube on, channel right. on a podcast. Correct. Yeah, yeah. we'll Good be sure to. Thank you. Um, we'll be sure to have to have you on there sometime. Um, but yeah, if, if anybody's interested in reaching out directly to Byron, please do. And of course, Rada Publishing, we'll be sure to link all the information down below. Be sure to get your copy of Awakening Star Seeds Volume 2 that just came out. And you have until the 17th, uh, practically giving away for free. So yeah. definitely here to serve. Yeah, I'm really happy for them. They put a lot yeah. of energy into this and and the writers mm -hmm. that they've brought. They've Everybody's done a lot. So I'm, I'm really Yes, for them. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you again. Have a good evening. Bye, everybody.